Good afternoon, Year 8. This is Miss Lawson bringing you um, an extension lesson. It's just uh, something that's optional. It's something that I know that some of you are asking for. You're wanting to push yourself over this time. Uh, you're finding, <clears throat> perhaps you're finding the book relatively okay and you're up to date with your tasks. And so you're really wanting something that's going to keep the boredom at bay, just keep that brain ticking over nicely. Um, there isn't actually anything to produce at the end of this lesson per se, but we are going to end up um, having a group online live chat on uh, Microsoft Teams together for those of us who want to take part in this. There's some questions we're going to pick up throughout this poem um, and kind of questions that we need to ask ourselves just as human beings actually and we're going to discuss that amongst ourselves in a, in a really kind of grown up mature fashion should you wish. Uh, if you don't want to that's absolutely fine just make sure you're keeping up to date with the rest of the tasks uh, as best as you can. Um, what we need to look at first is this image here it says a do now task it's not in blue and like i said you don't have to write anything down particularly i would like you to take some notes and you are going to have to have a copy of the poem which i'm going to explain to you how you're going to do that as well but it says do now task just ask yourself these questions uh, what are these birds for instance um, and what kind of image does this portray in our heads what are those birds and what are the um, the connotations we link with those. Um, there are lots of different ideas and values that are linked with these animals, these birds. So have a look, have a look at what's in between them as well, what's going on amongst them. Uh, and just take a couple of minutes, just have a look at that image, come up with some words and ideas, um, what it portrays inside your heads. Okay, for us to be able to understand not just this poem, but the book and actually humankind in general, we can ask ourselves actually. Um, it's up to one of us to decide whether we choose to see the good in someone who is inherently just an evil um, being. This is the evil here. Do we choose to see the good? Or is it more disturbing when we have a really good person, but there's just like a hint of evil? And now actually, is there an idea that everyone is all evil or good? Or can we actually be um, open to the idea that everyone has a bit of part of both of those? inside them um, and therefore are we upset and disheartened by the idea that even in the, all the good people there are still some evil inside of them um, we're going to discuss this in more depth if you understand these two pictures um, you're going to understand the poem no problem at all okay so the poem is called vultures it's by Chinua Achebe excuse my pronunciation and it was uh, written in 1971 on the outset, it looks really um, quite muddled, and you would be right in thinking so. There isn't any particular structure of the four stanzas. Each stanza is in a different length. There's no rhyme. There's no rhythm. In actual fact, he's used adjournment, which is where the sentences um, go over to the next line and to the next line. There's 51 lines and only six sentences, which is really, really interesting. And it's actually each stanza then doesn't link on from the previous one. So you might be forgiven for thinking it's, you know, it's just a, a ramble of notes, but actually it's not. They're very, very linked. <clears throat> We're looking at juxtaposition during our lesson this week and contrast, and it's exactly the same thing in this. This is why I wanted to do this poem with you. Is A, it links into our boy in the stri by striped pyjamas, because it does obviously mention the concentration camp. Um, but it also mentions good and evil, uh, and it's got lots of contrast and juxtaposition in this poem. So what we need to do is to either, if you have a printer at home, fantastic, you can print this off. Um, I've put it onto Microsoft Teams for you. Um, or you can take the time, just the next five minutes, to copy it down into your exercise book or your book. You are going to have to have a copy of this. I know lots of you love picking apart and analysing language, and you're not really particularly feeling overly stretched at the moment, which is fantastic, this is what I'm here for. So I'm going to stretch you a little, but you are going to need to have the poem. And some of you also really are, seem to be obsessed with highlighters. <laughs> so get your highlighters out. We're going to look at all sorts of, of language and structure here and the meaning of it. And by the end of this lesson, you will understand um, what uh, the poet is trying to do. Before we get on to actually analysing it, there are some uh, new vocabulary here, some new terms that we're not going to particularly necessarily be aware of. Um, harbingers in line three, it's it's a it's a person that basically announces the approach of someone or something. Um, a charnel house is a vault uh, where dead bodies or bones are kept. Belson camp, now this is really key, this is where it links in with our book for us. So Bergen Belson was one of the most notorious concentration camps in the Second World War. It became a camp for those who were too weak. Uh, and someone like Anne Frank, she was taken there 
and she died there sadly. Um, the camp was liberated in 1945 at the end of the Second World War, but obviously by that point, um, absolutely thousands and thousands of atrocities had happened in that time. Um, so obviously we're looking at outfits in the, the book at the moment, but Belson was a, an, another example of that type of concentration camp. Uh, kindred, related by blood or close family, so your kin, your kind. Um, perpetuity, going on forever. Um, bounteous providence, I love that. Bounteous, bounty, thinking about pirates, collecting your bounty. And providence, being a good, good luck. So all good things that God gives to mankind, good fortune. So probably what you're going to do is just highlight those um, few words onto your poem and um, perhaps you just uh, annotate to the left or the right of it, just explaining what those are so that you know um, and hopefully <clears throat> by the end of the lesson, at the very least, you'll have learnt some new vocabulary. Okay, so who is this man here? His name is Joseph Kramer. Um, he was a commandant of the Berg and Belsen concentration camp. If you look at the word commandant here, commander, someone who's in charge. He was dubbed the Beast of Belsen by camp inmates and he was a notorious Nazi war criminal. Uh, he was directly responsible for the deaths of thousands of people. He was convicted in war crimes and hanged uh, after World War II. Okay, so what we need to start thinking about, um, I want to relate it to the poem and I also want to relate it to the book that we are reading at the moment. So. Who would be uh, a character from the boy in the striped pyjamas that would be linked into someone like Joseph Kramer? Okay, we are going to take it one stanza at a time. The very first stanza here is the longest stanza. And like I said, there isn't any particular structure. It's quite a chaotic um, structure here, but there is a, a reason for it. Um, at the very, very beginning, let's read it together. In the greyness and the drizzle of one despondent dawn unstirred by harbingers of sunbreak, a vulture perching high on broken bone of a dead tree, nestled close to his mate, his smooth bashed in head, a pebble on a stem rooted in the dump of gross feathers, inclined affectionately to hers. Yesterday they picked the eyes from a swollen corpse in a water leg trench, log trench, sorry, and ate the things in its bow. Full gorge they chose their roost and keeping the hollowed remnant an easy range of his cold or cold telescopic eyes. Okay. Ignore these two pictures for a second. Here we are purely talking about the vultures. And if you think about the very first um, picture that I showed you, that was very clearly a vulture picking apart a carcass of a dead animal. The very, very beginning, and you can get your highlighter with me and we can do this together. We've got this lovely and pathetic fallacy here in the greyness and drizzle of one despondent dawn. The despondent drizzle. If you notice, we've got the alliteration, which creates the emphasis, but they're all kind of heavy Ds. It gives us the duh, duh, duh sound, okay? So it's immediately we're, we're aware that something um, is not right with the situation. And it says it's unstirred by the harbingers of some break, so nothing's going to penetrate that dull, awful dawn. Um, a vulture perching high on broken bone of a dead tree. So here we are. The first introduction to the vulture was obviously the title of the poem. But it says it's nestled close to his mate. So we've got this idea that there's now two vultures and their mates, obviously, uh, mating pair, a female and a male. Uh, mate his smooth bashed in head uh, a pebble he hasn't got a bashed in head it's just a describing if you um, google any image of a vulture they're not particularly the, uh, the prettiest of animals or birds um, and he says it's a pebble which gives us that uh, image of being really cold something stone like on a stem rooted in a dump of gross feathers so the stem clearly his neck here and these are the dump gross feathers so we've got this imagery first off of this really uh, quite vulgar disgusting bird um, some of the, the choices of word here bashed in head let's highlight that and hopefully you can do that with me um, the idea of pebble for instance as well stone like and cold um, we also have here um, the bone of a dead tree um, and like I said, we've got the word despondent. So, so far, 
you've got this really, really very morbid, um, down, depressing imagery that the author or the poet has chosen to write. Okay. Also, the word broken. If you have a look here, greyness, drizzle, despondent, broken, bone of a dead tree, bashed in head, a pebble. It carries on a dump of gross feathers. So it's it's like the birds have been sort of put together randomly, a dump of gross feathers. But yet the next line is actually quite sweet, which is, like I said, going back to that contrast and that juxtaposition between um, the images, inclined affectionately. So you wouldn't actually expect, I'm going to do it in a different colour, you wouldn't expect the word affectionately to be a popped into this poem so far. You certainly wouldn't expect it to be described between two birds and especially vultures. Okay, because vultures, if you look back on that very first image that we were looking at, here, it would be nothing that you would ever get um, put down for it as affectionate here. So list the idea. I'd be very surprised if any of you had put affectionate. So affectionate it means be kind, touchy, feely, tender. Um, so the, amongst all of this awful, awful image, there is this two birds <clears throat> that they are inclined affectionately to hers. So they're being pulled in together. And yesterday they picked the eyes of a swollen corpse in a water-logged trench and ate the things in its bow. So bam, we're back in again to that awful imagery. imagery sorry. Um, apart from the word they, which obviously shows us the image that they're working together, we've got the word picked which is really not a very nice word when you're talking about anything really uh, the eyes from a swollen corpse so corpse a dead body in a waterlogged trench that whole thing um trench is like a type of, type of ditch and it's waterlogged it's got lots of water in it i'm not going to explain further about the swollen corpse in water it's not a particularly nice thing we want to talk about but it is just an example of how we've got all of this um symbolism and imagery but yet the word affectionately is plonked literally plonked into the middle of it and um, they ate the things in its bowel of the animal and full gauze they chose their roost keeping the hollowed remnant in easy range of cold telescopic eyes interestingly is what they're saying is that he's saying sorry is that the vultures are choosing their roost which is where they sleep but they're keeping a close eye on the remnant, i.e. the corpse that they've been picking apart. So they can still see it, it's not near them now, they've gone to sleep, probably had their full gorged, gorged means to, to stuff yourself, to fill just fill yourself. But you know, you can still see it. Now interestingly the imagery of, that he's chosen to use for the birds, um if you think about the word cold and telescopic, if you think about perhaps it's like a gun, um, remember this is World War Two we're talking about here. It's quite, it's like a, it's like um, uh, like uh, a gun essentially. Um, so they're keeping their eyes on it, um, and it's not going anywhere. So if you notice here, this is a massive contrast. It's one word here. You could um, put this one as blue here as well. Um, but it's interesting how we've got these two ideas here of this close nestled affectionate vultures but amongst all of this evil um, and downright awful imagery right and the second stanza i've got this interesting here we've got just that one word beginning of this um this line here so a classic clear example of the genre strange indeed how love in other ways so particular will pick a corner in that charnel house tidy it and coil up there perhaps and even fall asleep her face turned to the wall now we could be miscon um, miscon um, misunderstood as thinking that he's talking about the female vulture here what he's trying to talk about is love in, in general he says that how love in other ways so particular so how love usually has to have a certain um a feeling for it to happen it has to be we tend to think about love we think about romance we think about moonlight we think about stars this type of love here is going to pick a corner in that house or that that room where the dead bodies are kept tidy it maybe they're picking apart the, the corpses and, and the, the the bones and coil up there 
and perhaps even fall asleep. So they're even this love isn't even willing to sleep um, with her face turned to the wall. So she's ignoring what's going on in this room here around the dead bodies and she's choosing to even sleep there so love is present even in that awful situation okay so if you think about this very first stanza we can clearly see that these two vultures here are capable of caring and loving one another in what is an awful situation and this is what he's saying he's saying that the love is still able to happen in this awful charnel house and not only that it's going to tidy it make the best of it coil up there interestingly chosen the word coil it's kind of kind of like a snake isn't it coiled up there um but it means nice and tight and the turn of her face turned to the wall she's going to fall asleep ignoring what's going on here now we have another contrast that's the commandant at belsom which is where we broke uh, brought on to this man here that we've just looked at <clears throat> Camp going home for the day with fumes of human roast clinging rebelliously to his hairy nostrils will stop at the wayside sweet shop. I'll be doing more for a second. So the Commandant of Belson camp is going home for the day, which is really interesting imagery, actually, because when you're thinking about Bruno's father, you're thinking about people that would work in a concentration camp, you don't see them as average normal human being you don't see that they would be clocking off at the end of a long day perhaps you think you know miss lawson leaves work at half past four in the afternoon five o'clock sometimes and i'm done for the day and i go home and i go to my children well yep fair enough i'm a teacher but actually can you imagine as someone who's gone to a concentration camp and who's personally responsible for killing thousand people and he's clocked off for the day okay but once he's finished for the day he's going home it says the fumes the fumes of human roast. This is pretty dark, guys. I'm not going to lie. Um, obviously, it's to do with the death that he's been involved in. And it's his clinging rebelliously. So the, the, the smells. And it's not just the smells. It's going to be that, um, that idea that he's taken um, those people's lives and it's stuck to him um, rebelliously. Uh, to his hairy nostrils. With, with he was going to stop at the wayside sweet shop and pick up a chocolate for his tender offspring waiting at home for daddy's return so we've got this idea that yeah he's going home he's a normal human being he's just doing his job he's then got the remnants of his his day's work which obviously the fumes of human um, bodies burning clinging to him still but he's chosen to stop at a sweet shop and get his child some chocolate so tender offspring offspring is, your is a child who's waiting at home for daddy's return so the idea that we would perhaps be at home and we're waiting for our parents to come home from work or someone that we really um, love and we're waiting for them to return and so there's this idea that this child is waiting for someone such as him at home which is, is such a, a juxtaposition, it's such a stark contrast between the two. So if you want to just stop here for a second, um, you can highlight all the negatives, just the same as we did with the birds, um, with the, the vultures. I'm going to highlight, um, highlight rebelliously. Obviously rebellious means to go against what should be happening. The idea he's got hairy nostrils, I think, um, is an idea that he's quite like an animal, which gives an impression, actually, of what he's doing on a day-to-day -day job. He's acting like an animal. He's not thinking like a human being, is he? He's not thinking that um, what he's doing is wrong, which is kind of animalistic behaviour. But then we've got stopped at the wayside sweet shop. The idea of a sweet shop, it's a really nice image. Actually, if you think about whenever you get to go to the sweet shop, you're excited, um, you're looking forward to what you're choosing. It's a really, really lovely stark contrast to the idea of Belson Camp. I mean, could you ever put two such um, clearly opposing images inside your head in one stanza? Belson Camp, human roast, then go to the sweet shop and pick up a chocolate for tender offspring. Such an off opposite. Okay, so again, thinking about the vultures, we've got that, <clears throat> the blue versus the yellow. Now we're going to look at this man who's also 
got these two different sides to him. Okay. The idea that he said daddy's return is very, very childlike. It's he's not said father, he's not said um dad, it's daddy's. Okay, so it's very childlike, it's very innocent, it's very sweet. You can imagine you know, a small three or four year old child waiting at home, eagerly looking through the window, waiting for daddy's return. Not only because he's got chocolate, but because he probably missed his father. Okay, so this idea that this man uh, overall is a really nasty man. Um, he's been doing these awful things, but yet he's still got that soft side to him inside because he's still bringing something home for his child. And he and he's not just a concentration camp commandant. Commandant, sorry, he is a dad. He's a daddy. Just shows you that different different sides to that person okay and your final stanza praise bounteous providence if you will that grants even an ogre a tiny glowworm tenderness encapsulated in icy caverns of a cruel heart stop there for a second so praise bounteous providence we said praise the lord praise um good luck praise good fortune if you will that gives us the opportunity or gives us this awful man, Ogre, think about Shrek, um, a tiny glowworm of tenderness. Glowworm is a really lovely um, image of this tiny, small, tiny, tiny, small worm that gives off this very um, subtle light. I don't know if many people have seen a glowworm, um, but if you can imagine what they would look like, you're giving off this very dull um, glow. Okay, so he's saying in this awful man, there is a tiny part of him that is sweet and tender. Okay, so let's let's highlight that with our blue and tenderness. Okay, but then what encapsulated? So encapsulated, encased, locked in, in icy caverns of a cruel heart. Okay, so now we're saying. That um, this man, the commandant of this of this uh, concentration camp, he has this tiny little piece of goodness with inside of him for his child, but yet it's locked into this icy caverns, caverns like a cave. It's cavernous, it's vast, um, of a cruel heart. Or, and this is where the poets are asking us to ask these questions. Or else, despair for in the very germ of that kindred love is lodged the perpetuity of evil so we have kindred love let's put that here blue but yet we've gone back here to the never-ending bad never-ending evil that still goes on regardless there's a little bit of love here the fact that he's mentioned the word germ germ gives us the connotation actually of something not very nice okay germs which is interesting when we think about a pandemic. So germs are like infecting, um, infecting the love here. So it's not necessarily just a lovely, oozy kindred love. It's a, it's, it's a germ. It's infested. It's it's um, it's kind of infecting him. So if you can see again, we've got that contrast in this in this stanza between the two um, different ideas: good versus evil. And what he's saying in this last stanza is, evil creatures here um, are doing good, um, i.e. the vultures, or the, the, the man here who should be good, he's doing awful things. And he's asking us this question, what is more disturbing? Are we more disturbed by the vulture, who actually is an evil creature, it picks apart and, and preys on death, Okay, it's linked very heavily with death. But yet it still shows us this ever small glimpse of affection and love for its mate. Or are we more disturbed by the fact that it's this human being, he was a father, he's a daddy, he obviously cares about his child, yet he does his awful, grotesque things to the Jewish people in the concentration camp. And it's really interesting that we can actually um, we can have a discussion on Microsoft Teams of where we're going to come to that uh, that conclusion because actually this poem is ambiguous there is no clear answer we could start to see actually um, looking at it uh, ooh, looking at how it's ended um, 
is actually asking us this question. Um, yes, we should be um, feeling lucky that actually a man like this or any man who's doing these awful things has shown a little bit of tenderness. Or should we feel despair? Despair, that should also be highlighted. Are we feeling a lack of, lack of hope that actually um, the fact that, sorry, are we feeling despair? That even when someone like this, he's still got this never-ending evil going on inside of him. Um, one way that you can look at it, I wanted you to just you know, do a minimal amount of writing. I want you to do more thinking and discussing, which we're going to discuss over onto Microsoft Teams, as I said. But I want you to have a look back at the very first stanza and pick out some words of the vultures. And you can do this with every stanza if you wish, but it's really crucial that you do it for the first stanza. And I want you to write down the words that convey the impression to you of being disgusted. Okay. Um, in this extension task, I would like you to just recap on your semantic field work that we've done in class. Um, which fields can you spot? Which ones um, has the poet used to convey the idea that these vultures are disgusting? And then you can do the same for the commandant um, and you can see which words were discussed with that um, that man and his role, what he was taking part. Whilst you're doing that, in what way is the novel and the poem similar in their presentation? Okay, we've obviously got this man here who's in the poem, but where else can we see that character within the book that we're looking at? Explain the nature of the job, explain the family role. Okay, so Ralph. Bruno's father was a soldier in the Great World War uh, One, and he was promoted to commandant of the German army by Hitler during World War Two. Now, the whole reason why we find ourselves in this book is that Bruno and his family are having to move nearer this concentration camp, and during the, the week's work, we looked at the, the contrast between this house with the garden and the bench and the pathway. And then just literally 20 feet away was his concentration camp. But the father is strict and intimidating, yes, but he does express tenderness toward his family. And ultimately, regardless if he does or he doesn't, he's still a dad. He's still someone's father. Um, and that is sort of like that dramatic irony that we understand within that book, the very first 10 chapters. Is we, we know as an audience what he's actually going about doing each day. Um, Bruno just knows that his um, his father is something important, and there's lots of people milling about the house in important uniforms. Um, he's obviously got this study. Um, and we don't really he doesn't really know what's what his job is. He's never asked. He actually clearly says that in chapter I think it's chapter three. He doesn't really understand. We as the audience members do. So it's that real shocking factor that someone's father, someone's daddy can be doing that uh, as a job, going off to work after breakfast, coming home um, before supper time, and, and having done all those awful, atrocious crimes, and yet still be someone's dad. Okay, so like I said, the conclusion of the poem is ambiguous. So the three questions we're going to discuss on Microsoft Teams and I will give you a date and a time where I will be live and you can take part in that with me. Um, how do you feel um, Chaby wants us to leave the poem? Okay, so how do you think he wants us? How, you can tell me, how do you now feel? Do you feel positive that actually even the most evil things can have that lovely side to them of being affectionate and being kind and being caring and that love can survive in awful situations? Or do you feel despair because actually despite that love, um, they can't stop committing evil? So, you know, the commandant was picking up the chocolate for his child, going home to be a daddy, yet he's still committing evil for every day. And then we're going to discuss that actually the idea, the concept. Um, and this should be in inverted commas. As this is what we're going to discuss. There are no evil people because evil people are capable of good. Okay, so even the most evil people. If you think about them, um, if some of you have studied history and you've seen um, old footage of Adolf Hitler himself, actually, <clears throat> we know just kind of. Uh, I, mean, I keep saying the word atrocious and atrocity, but that's the only word that I can really keep saying about what Hitler in World War II did to those, those minority groups. Um, we still see this video footage of him playing at home with his, with his dog, for instance, with his puppy, and we knew that he had his, his partner, his girlfriend, his wife. He's still a man who enjoyed going home uh, and dogs, and he still loved, but yet he did this most barbaric um, 
use these barbaric actions. But we're going to discuss that point. And then we're also going to discuss the idea that there actually simply isn't a such a thing as good or evil. Okay, there is some perhaps a line between the two. If we look back at that picture here, which is what we're going to be discussing, um, go through, write down the poem. Um, I'll leave it on here so you can pause it. Um, I have put it on Microsoft Teams for you as well, should you have the option to be able to print it off. And then we're going to come together as a class, hopefully um, 10 plus of you all kind of join in. Um, I will need your permission from your um, your caregivers to make sure that I can see your face, if you would like to show uh, your face on there to actually have that interaction with one another. If not, you can just do your audio. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to kind of discussing this poem with you and how it links in with the book. Um, carry on looking at the kind of any, any other further alliteration, look at the structure, look at the fact that there's so much enjoyment going on, there's actually no structure in terms of the lines or the rhyme or the free verse, and then you can start trying to answer the question why he's done that um, and see what other things you like about this poem. Hopefully, um, it's giving you something to think about. Okay, I will look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you very much, Year 8.